These are the five worst projects I have ever built, but it doesn't mean I regret building them. All combined, they have paid me a total of $131,708 from YouTube. So in this video, I'll break down how I built each project, what I didn't like about it, and most importantly, how much each video paid me. The first worst build I call the trypophobia table. And if you don't know, I was told trypophobia is a fake disorder used by sorority girls to get attention at parties. I can't speak to that, but what I can say is this piece ended up selling for $2,500 and the video made me $5,486. I am pretty sure this is a piece of ponderosa pine. And there was a time when I would ask people in the comments, I'd say, hey, if you definitely know what kind of wood this is, let me know in the comments. And what I found is when I say, let me know if you definitely know what this is, people will tell me when they are about 10 to 15% sure, and that doesn't really help anybody. So let's just settle on this being ponderosa pine and go from there. After I got the center section of this piece that is most definitely ponderosa pine, pretty well charred, I took it over to my stump flattening jig, which is just a pretty simple setup using aluminum extrusion. And this is what makes it the quote trypophobia table, if you wanna believe that's an actual disorder or not. And I'm using a little cut saw carving burr and they make a bunch of different sizes and you can actually make all kinds of crazy patterns using different types of carving burrs. That one doesn't creep me out. I know it does genuinely bother a lot of people, but let me know what you think if it's a real disorder or not. At this point, you might be thinking, this guy is out of his mind. There's no way he turns this into something cool that actually sells. And I will say that you're maybe half right, but it does sell in the end. And before I can get to that though, I needed to kind of solidify all of this char. And so to do that, I'm using a slow curing epoxy. This takes a couple days to cure, so it's gonna soak in and not leave a bunch of bubbles. If I just used like a tabletop epoxy, it would leave a ton of bubbles. So spent a lot of time sealing this up and now I'm sealing the center section for the deep pour. And I did have to do this in a few different sections because the deep pour can still only be poured about three inches or so. And it took me a little while to get it sealed up, but after about a week or so of filling it, I got it almost all the way up and I wanted to use tabletop epoxy for the very top, which is what I'm mixing up here. The reason I went with this tabletop epoxy is it cures a little bit flatter and a little bit harder than that deep pour epoxy. So after that cured, I went to work on removing the tape, which was more work than I thought. And I actually had a lot of epoxy kind of spill over and needed to do something about that. So my first idea was I'll just kind of grind it off and as I ground it off, I was like, oh, this kind of reintroduces that light wood with the char. And I actually really liked it. I don't even know what you would call this. It's almost like some sort of binary pattern or some sort of computer pattern, but I thought it was cool. My wife came out when I was doing this and she absolutely hated it. She thought there was a horrible accident with it. And I was like, oh, I, I think it's cool. So if it's not for you, you're not alone, but I actually like the way it looked. This was my idea for the underside. I created a little jig and I bought these puck lights and I'm actually gonna be inserting a light into that later. For the finish on the sides, I'm using Rubio Monaco because it's just a nice flat finish and I didn't really want a bunch of gloss and sheen on that charred wood and that lighter wood. On the top, however, this is where I wanted to go full mirror shine. So I'm actually wet sanding the top and we're gonna use automotive compounds to buff this all the way up to a mirror shine. and. I didn't know if this was gonna look good, but I do like a nice high gloss sheen. Just see how that works with the kind of matte sides. The compound I'm using here, if you're interested, is the 3M Perfectit system. And I am not an automotive expert. I buffed a handful of things, but I still feel like I have a long ways to go on becoming a professional buffer and polisher. But I think right there, pretty decent shine. Spent a little bit more time on it. And yeah, that's probably about as good as I can do anyway. And for the legs, I found these really cool solid brass legs. At least I think they're cool. And I think that brass with black always looks awesome. So inserting some threaded inserts, getting these kind of triangulated, which they actually came in a set of four, but I thought four was too many on this relatively small table. But this is how I'm holding the light in. It'll, it'll enable it to be accessed easily. I did learn that it's an IR remote, which doesn't work unless it has line of sight. So that was an oversight by me. and. Here's how it looks in the end. And I actually hate it. I don't think this is for me, but you know what? That's okay. I don't have to love everything I make. I'm not gonna be biased just cause I made it. But in the end, I put it up on my website. Somebody paid $2,500 for it. And I'm thrilled that they liked it enough to put it in their home. This next build started out pretty cool, but in the end, I wasn't happy with how the base turned out. So I didn't even put it up for sale, but the video did pay me $27,721. 
This is a worthless piece of wood, and I mean that quite literally. This piece of wood was given to me by my wood supplier because they said they couldn't do anything with it. I thought that it had some really cool figures, some really cool grains, and yeah, it had a lot of cracks, but I thought I might be able to do something with it. So took it home, got it squared up, put it on the bandsaw, really maxed out as high as that bandsaw would cut, and here's what it made. It made a Rafiki. It looks just like a mandrel to me. I don't know what you see, but it's kind of a Rorschach type of test. Anyway, I thought it was cool enough to keep going, so I put a couple dominoes in, got it clamped up, and now I wasn't quite sure the exact shape it was going to take, but I wanted to make sure all the defects were filled, and for that I used some black resin because as cool as cracks are, people generally want a little bit smoother of a top than that kind of busted up walnut would have allowed for. Now I can get going on the table base. I really hope you don't mind me sharing how much each one of these videos paid me. It's just that I feel so incredibly fortunate to do what I love every single day. And I would love to encourage anybody out there to pursue their dreams. And it doesn't have to be being a woodworking YouTuber. Maybe you want to start a photography channel or a cooking channel or anything else in that kind of DIY space. We just launched a course to help you accomplish that goal. And this course will take you from the very, very beginnings all the way through some pretty advanced analytics working with sponsors, and so much more. It's over four and a half hours long. It's one of the best things I've ever done. And if you want some more information on that, there's a link in the video description. What I am doing here is called power carving. It's basically a wood carving disc on an angle grinder. And it's for those of us that want to pretend like we're sculptors, but don't have the patience to just chisel something away. And it's actually pretty fun because if you mess up, you don't have a whole week invested in it. And it really kind of lets you be as creative as you want. And this probably wasn't my best design. I thought that it was going to be a little bit more proportionate. But at the end, that bistro height and this kind of spindly leg looks a little bit like a flamingo leg. And I think I could do a little bit better the next time. On the underside, though, I wanted it to sit flat. So the best way to do that is to carve out this center section and leave just a lip along the edge. And that will make it much easier for this to sit on any surface. The finish that I'm using on this and most of my projects lately is called Rubia Monocoat. It is a hard wax oil finish, really simple to use. You basically wipe it on, let it get saturated, and then wipe off all the excess. And it really enables you to feel the grain and just highlights that natural, really beauty of the walnut. And now I can get back to working on this top, which I wasn't entirely sure what it was going to look like coming out of the planer, but yeah, I still think that it looks like a mandrel. It's kind of a wild looking piece and everybody seems to see something else in it. I've heard the Napster logo. I've heard a black tailed deer. I've heard a uh, jackalope. I would love to know what you see in it because it kind of amuses me every time I hear something new. I absolutely stand by the fact that this is one of my five worst builds of all time, but not because of this top. I really, really like the way this top turned out. I did say that I will repurpose it on another piece. It was just the way this stand turned out. It was kind of spindly, it was too tall. I got a little too artsy with the kind of curve of it, so I will not be using this stand on another project. However, this next build was my most viewed YouTube video of all time at almost 30 million views and paid me $70,533. This is a $20 chunk of silver maple that I've had for a couple of years, and I'd been holding onto this without really having a plan for it until I saw a very interesting Reddit post. In this Reddit post, this guy had a small piece of wood that he'd burned and covered it with epoxy, and it gave this incredible 3D look, and I thought, wow, that would be awesome if I could replicate that on an entire table, but I didn't know how feasible it was, because when you burn wood like this, it warps and twists and totally becomes a different animal but if I can pull it off, it'll be freaking cool. I burned each side as evenly as I could going back and forth because you'd burn one side and the other side would warp. So you'd flip it over, burn that side, and then you would kind of seesaw back and forth with this potato chip slab. And I eventually got it to a point where I felt like I could proceed with the sealing process. And here I'm using a deep pour epoxy, which is normally only used for the say two inch thick pours. But what I like about it is how slowly it's going to cure. And if I was to use a fast cure epoxy here, just a regular tabletop epoxy, it would leave an endless amount of bubbles. But this deep pour epoxy will just soak in before it cures and not leave any bubbles. Speaking of bubbles, you can see just how much air is inside this charred wood with all of those bubbles that are coming out. So I continued this basting process 
until no more air was coming out. But I also didn't want to pool up the epoxy at this point because again, anywhere this epoxy pools up is going to leave an endless amount of bubbles. So just continued basting it for about a day or so. And now I'm ready for the deep pour because what I'm going to do, I'm going to encapsulate the whole thing with the minimum amount of epoxy to keep it just crystal clear over the top, but not make it look like there's an inch of epoxy on top of it. I ended up pouring all in all, I would say probably a half inch over the top of it, but I am going to plane this down in the end. And here's my way of kind of trying to protect it from any dust in the air. I let that epoxy cure for about two weeks before taking it out of the form here. And this was going to be really telling. I was going to be able to see just how well that epoxy did. And so far, I feel like I'm on the right track. But now I need to go surface it at Creative Woodworking because they have an awesome big wide belt sander slash planer. And this is going to get it perfectly flat. However, I ran into a huge problem here because that slab was so twisted. As I got it surfaced, it came out and I eventually ended up nicking one of the corners, which you'll see here in a little bit. I thought I'd ruined it, but it actually ended up being my favorite part of the table. This piece took a lot of sanding. I love these vacuum clamps because they hold everything really sturdy and you can just rotate it around and get to all sides of it without having to clamp it down. But this was an absolute nightmare and it would have been nice if I could just polish this up straight, but I nicked that one corner. You can just barely see it up there in the right hand corner and that made it so I had to add another coat of this tabletop epoxy. And you can see here, although it looks kind of cool at this angle, I did a horrible job. I did my best to keep the dust out of it, but it did not self-level very well. That is not going to work for me. So my next attempt was going to be to get it much warmer, but first I had to sand out all of those dust nibs and hairs. And to get it warm, I set it out in the sun for a little while just to really heat it up, got it up to about 105 degrees or so. And this was hopefully going to make this next coat self-level much, much better. I spent a little bit more time spreading it out a little more evenly, and this next coat went on much, much better. You can see there, you can really start to see that char, start to see that 3D effect. But to get it perfect, I have to do a lot more sanding. And now I'm moving on to the wet sanding stage. And I am not an automotive guy. I do my best, and I can buff things out okay, but I am far from a professional. In the end, though, this one turned out pretty good, but I'm sure some automotive guys out there would have something to say about that. Now that I was ready to work on the buffing compounds, and this is just regular automotive compounds. It's a 3M system, and you'll see here there's still a bit of distortion. Those lights really should be perfectly straight, so it's a little bit wavy. Probably wouldn't win any car shows with this, but you can definitely see through it. It's definitely a high polish. Now I just need to get started on the legs. I felt like these legs should continue the char theme, but I didn't want a matching high gloss leg. So I'm going to char these, but I'm going to leave it as kind of a Shosugi Bond feel where you'll still be able to feel that wood texture and that wood grain. And I'm doing that with an Osmo. I believe this is a 3043. It's just going to soak in and kind of harden up that char, but still enable you to feel all of that wood grain. But it won't smell like smoke and it won't come off all sooty in your hands. Because this video got so many views, I had a number of people that reached out and tried to buy it. However, I wasn't sure how well this piece would hold up in the real world, so I didn't want to sell it. But the most I was offered was $5,000, and I still actually have this piece today. It's held up remarkably well. So what I decided, instead of taking the money, I'm going to be giving this away in an upcoming video. So if you want information on that, you can sign up to my email list and be the first to know. The next worst build was the last time I used blue epoxy. This table ended up selling for $4,000, but YouTube paid me $14,880. This table turned out exactly as I was expecting and the client was happy with it, but I would never make this table again because it was one of the ugliest tables I've ever made. The reason it was so ugly is the color of epoxy and it wasn't my choice, it was the client's choice and back then I would take just about any order I could get because I was just starting out and I could really use the money to help grow my business. However, now I feel like I will only take a commission if I think I can make a really cool looking table and here's why in my opinion, it's so ugly. It's this blue epoxy, which I know some people love. And I'll admit, it does look interesting. It's kind of cool, but having it in my house is just something I don't think I could do. But I'll show you how I did it in case you like it. If you're wondering what those little islands are there, they are exactly that. They are islands. The client wanted a little bit more interesting look down the center of it than just a straight blue epoxy river. So I used some tape to hold those islands in place. And Here's about 12 hours later, and this is what you have to do if you want to get the swirls in this metallic epoxy. Don't stick that stick all the way in there and start folding it over. You'll introduce a lot of bubbles that won't pop, and you can have a little bit of fun with it. You can make tight swirls. You can make crisscross swirls. You can come back and kind of uh, blow it out with like a heat gun or a hairdryer. You can make any design that you want here, and 
I do think this would be a fun project with kids and kids are allowed to make ugly stuff because that's what kids do. However, I'm a grown man. I'm not supposed to make ugly stuff. And so far, it looks kind of ugly. I took the top into creative woodworking to have it surfaced with their planer slash wide belt sander. And I will say, even though this top is pretty ugly, these legs ended up super cool. Although I've never actually remade these legs. These are made out of walnut and the client wanted a cool dovetail look. However, I'm kind of a hack woodworker and don't really know how to cut dovetails. So I'm gonna have to figure that out. I don't know much about dovetails, but I do know you need some good square lumber before even attempting the dovetails. So I got everything jointed and planed and then ripped down with my table saw to the sizes that we wanted. And now I'm gonna be using a dovetail jig and dovetail jig is just what it sounds like. It's a jig that cuts dovetails. However, they're not that easy. And I still am rather embarrassed that I've never spent the time to properly learn how to cut real dovetails by hand. So using the dovetail jig was my best bet. And I had to practice on a number of pieces of scraps before moving on to these walnut pieces because there's nothing worse than having the exact right amount pieces of walnut and then screwing one of them up and having to mill a whole bunch more. So spent way more time than I'm comfortable admitting assembling these dovetail legs, but in the end, they actually looked pretty cool. If you were wanting to try an epoxy table, I highly recommend sticking with steel legs for your very first project. Wood legs are cool, but the steel legs are just so much easier to bolt on. However, Nothing looks like this real walnut here. You can see this one actually has some really nice figure on it. This is gonna be kind of a console table, which I told him it's gonna be a little bit top heavy, so it could tip over and he was fine with that. I think he might have even been going to attach it to the wall. Now we can get back to this ugly tabletop, which I have in my crosscut sled here to get it cut down to its final size. You can see there I have the top touched up with a little bit more epoxy, which is why it looks shiny at this point. And now I can continue polishing or sanding this entire top, which was a lengthy process, but every time you go to sand a tabletop, it's a lengthy process. Just don't rush this part here because there's so much that comes from the proper sanding of these tables that can really separate the average ones or bad ones from the rel relatively respectable ones. Anytime I attach pretty much any table legs, I use these threaded inserts. It's just much better than using screws. Occasionally, I will just use regular wood screws depending on maybe a small pedestal mount or something like that but continued sanding on the tabletop and was almost ready for the finish, which was gonna be an Osmo Poly X. This is their kind of satin, which I'm actually gonna keep adding layers until I got it to, I don't wanna say a high gloss, but really a pretty, I don't know, semi-gloss plus at least. And it's kind of a lengthy process. You need to add a little bit, sand it lightly, add another coat, and you can see on these consecutive coats, it really starts to build the sheen and even out and looks really, really nice. I feel like I shouldn't have to say this, but something tells me I should anyway. When I say that I think a piece is ugly, that's exactly what I mean. I personally don't like it, and in no way am I saying that it would be wrong for someone to have a similar design in their home, because that is what's so great about art and design and furniture is it's all subjective, and all that really matters is do you like it in your space? Like this next piece coming up is a perfect ex example of that, because I actually love the way it looked, at least when it went out of my shop, the problem was after the customer got it, we ran into a major disaster, but this piece I believe sold for $2,500 and the YouTube video paid me $13,088. A friend of mine who's a more traditional woodworker had this leftover chunk of English walnut that he said he had no use for, but I am kind of a hack woodworker and I love random funky chunks like this, so I was thrilled to get it. And my idea is to make a round table and Top tip, if you ever wanna make a round table with epoxy, use this landscape edging. It is incredible. I got it at Home Depot. It's made of some composite plastic so the epoxy doesn't even stick to it. If you've ever wanted to try to build an epoxy table, here is a tip for you. And that is no straight edges touching the epoxy because the straight edges just look unnatural. So you'll notice every piece that's touching the resin in this one is only live edge. And at this point, I'm only rough cutting it. So don't worry about making a perfect circle because I'll cut a perfect circle at the very end. I mentioned earlier in the video that this ends up being one of my all time worst builds and for a few reasons that I'll show you in this video, but this was probably one of the first three or four epoxy tables I ever made. And since then, probably made another 70 or 80 and I have learned a lot, most importantly, how to avoid disasters like this. So I finally created a virtual epoxy workshop that's like three and a half hours long that gives you every single step to have success, but more importantly, avoid disasters. So if you wanna check that out, there's a link in the description or you can go to blacktailstudio.com. 
I've had some problems in the past not using mold release or not using enough mold release, but that wasn't one of the problems I had here. This is the problem that I had with this table. This is a white dye, and I think the white dye looks really cool with this dark brown walnut, but the problem is with the epoxy, and I knew that epoxy tended to yellow slightly over time, but I didn't know how much. And this is also another problem. People will often ask me why I don't fill up voids with blocks of wood, and I thought I'd save some epoxy and use those blocks of wood there, but the problem was I thought this was a very, very tinted epoxy, but in the end, you could actually just slightly see that walnut through the dye or through that white epoxy. So I don't love using blocks to fill it. You can see right there, you can faintly see the outline of the walnut. So I'm worried even with a black epoxy that you may be able to see any wood blocks floating in underneath it. Using these silicone or caulk dams is something I don't really do anymore. The idea is it'll hold all the epoxy away from the wood and you won't waste any. Problem is it almost always seems to find a way to seep over it, so I don't really do that anymore. And here's how it looks so far. And this actually is one of my favorite pieces before I have the problem. So I think it's actually looking really cool. I took it into this industrial shop, had it planed. This was one mistake that I made. And I do have a longer video on this project that I go into this a little bit more. But I thought that this thing locked down when I tightened those clamps for some reason. It was just a stupid mistake. And when I started making this circle, you can see it creep in and it was nowhere close to a true circle. And so I was pretty much devastated, but lucky for me, this was the underside of the table and I was able to fix it in the end. There are a lot of really good, really easy, really cheap ways to cut a perfect circle. And this is none of those ways. So I don't recommend using this exact method. I since then have purchased a circle cutting jig, but you can make your own out of plywood. And the idea is this though, I cut it down about a half an inch or so, then I came through with my jigsaw and I just made sure not to go over that line because the way I'm gonna get a perfect circle is on my router table here and using that perfect router half inch line that I cut there and now just truing it up with this flush trim bit. After I had it cut in a perfect circle, I thought it would look a little bit more modern if I added a chamfer to the underside. So this is a 22 and a half degree chamfer. I ended up using this on a lot of my tables so much so that eventually I ended up buying a giant custom made 22 degree bit for these even bigger tables than this. And this is the finish I'm using. Again, this is a finish I don't really recommend. This is Osmo and it looks really, really pretty, but you just don't get much protection from it. But I will say it looked incredible on this English walnut with that white epoxy. The table base that I went with was nice because it could be broken down, but in the end, I thought it looked a little bit cheap. I really prefer the fully welded pieces, but it is nice for customers to be able to ship this a little bit less expensive. And I do like the kind of classic design. I always say you should have either a statement top or a statement base, but not both on the same piece because this is such a wild top. I think that a really wild base would just distract from the overall design. And to attach it, I'm gonna use some threaded inserts. I use these on all my tables. They're just so much better than putting screws directly into it. And these are zinc ones, which I don't use anymore. I really recommend using the steel ones. So why is this table one of my biggest failures? Well, I sold this to a lady in Hawaii and she didn't open the box for a few months, but when she did, it looked like this. Yes, that white epoxy had turned completely yellow. That is not a trick of the camera. And so she called me, explained the situation. I immediately offered her money back or a replacement table. And she said she would prefer a replacement table. And then the next day she was so thankful for how I handled the situation, she ordered a $10,000 dining table from me. I hope you enjoyed my five worst builds a little bit more than I did, but here's one final breakdown to each video, how many views it got and how much YouTube paid me. And each week I like to give a little credit to people who make it all the way to the end of the video. So start your question or comment with your favorite of the worst builds. Thank you so much.